wonderful. Um, welcome everyone to the very first Cognitive Webinar. We're truly excited to be here and have Dr. Cordy as our first guest. Um, all right, so I believe we shall begin. Once again, hello everyone. Uh, this is Neslihan from Kogist, which is a community where students and professionals from uh, various fields of study gather around to make resources based on cognitive sciences accessible and provide students a way of communication through the events we hold uh, throughout the year, such as the Academy Cognition, which is a series of talks given preferably by um, undergraduates and uh, graduate students um, about like 50-ish minutes. And book cognition um, that provides an opportunity for professors and students to gather around to exchange ideas, um, revolved around a book of choice for several weeks. And uh, growing up in science, uh, where professors share their lifelong experiences um, about the academic life. Uh, you can follow our accounts on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And you can also support us from the patreon.com. And we truly appreciate your support. Today's event, named the Cognitive Webinar, is designed to be online and held entirely in English, aiming for an international audience. Uh, we would like to provide a platform not just for science communication, but also an interaction of academics from all over the world. Uh, today, uh, we're going to listen to Dr. Karnak Kordi, who is a computational neuroscientist and also a data scientist. Uh, he got his PhD in physics from the Federal Institute um, of Technology in Zurich. Also, he's one of the pioneers and contributors of the NeuroMatch Academy. Uh, his talk for this event will be based on reverse engineering behavior and brains. And the talk will last about 30 to 40 minutes. And then we're going to give a uh, five to 10 minute short break. Uh, after the break, we're going to proceed with um, the Q&A session, which will also approximately last um, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, um, we would like our attendees to ask their questions with their microphones and cameras open if possible, but it's not a requirement. You can also ask questions through uh, the YouTube and the Zoom chats. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we will be recording the events for the future use. So if anyone has any questions or concerns about it, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, and Dr. Cording, please take us away whenever you're ready. <laughs> great. Thanks so much for the in uh, great introduction. Uh, today I will be talking about something that in a way all of us do, which is we reverse engineer behavior in brains. And I will try and structure that space a little bit. And I thought like taking this very high level view was going to be a good thing for the kickoff talk for these like webinars. But before I really start, I first want to congratulate COG IST and uh, because neuroscience is a global endeavor. Now, like we all try and understand the same things. We come together at conferences and summer schools and I want to shout out to NeuroMatch as, as well here. And we work together in countless ways. And for that, we need this like multi-layer structure of communication where we talk broadly, maybe with like some experts that we invite, but also locally with people working on related projects. And almost all the good things in science comes, come from collaboration with people with different backgrounds, maybe different locations, different topics, different questions, different backgrounds. And that's why I think it's so fantastic what you guys at COG IST are doing. And we need outreach in all languages and countries. And you help make thinking about brains accessible. And I want to thank you for this initiative and the energy that you're bringing into this space. Now, let's talk about reverse engineering. And I always like to give the exact definitions of words. So reverse engineering is defined as the reproduction of another manufacturer's product following detailed examination of its construction or composition. 
And uh, I should first say what we might mean about manufacture in that case. As scientists, we're probably talking about evolution as the manufacturer, not the big manufacturer in the sky. But uh, so let's let's take that definition of reverse engineering and talk about the components of it. So. Um, what do we mean with reverse engineering? Well, the first thing is it says reproduction in the definition. So for me, reproduction means that we want to be able to build it, at least build the relevant, interesting components of it. It's not enough if we just have a collection of things that we uh, know about it. We really want to build something like that, or at least repair it. And when we talk about repair, that is brain diseases that we want to do something about. When we say build, we might want to build an AI system, or we want to at least understand kind of how it's being set up in biology. And when we talk about another manufacturer, in this case, of course, we mean evolution or like over time, brains have gotten different and they've gotten better at solving certain tasks, namely the tasks that are important in the ecological niche of an animal. And that means that we know an awful lot about it. and I will talk about it later, but like this is in a way what justifies normative thinking. And then we want to have a detailed examination. So we want to look at the principles and so forth. And then it says construction or composition. And I think there's like a lot of rich detail hiding in construction or composition, whereas we might interpret construction more like the process with which it's being built and composition more as the pieces that it's being built out of. And um, and that brings us to the level of granularity that we strive for as neuroscientists and as cognitive scientists. And like, what is the language in which we want to describe behavior? What is the language in which we want to describe the nervous system? And it's an important choice. Do we want to talk about something being optimized and what is optimized? Or do we maybe just want the parts? Uh, do we want to know about the molecules or the atoms or what exactly is it that we want to know about this? So let's talk about construction and composition a little more. Imagine there's a radio. You want to understand the radio. And I want to, to briefly mention here, this is, um, uh, this is the link to a great paper that is uh, uh, that um, uh, of Lazepnik who, who asks, uh, uh, what you learn when you do biology in a way. Uh, it was, uh, the subtitle was, what I learned studying apoptosis. But, but it's, I think it's an important question that we want to ask as cognitive scientists and neuroscientists, which is, what is that level of language that we want to have for what we describe? So if we talk about things that are optimized, we can say, in a normative way, what, what should the objectives be? Let's say if we talk about a radio, we can say, well, the radio is designed by humans to make music or like to play transmissions. And we can say from a normative perspective, therefore, we already know certain things about the radio, namely that all components in a way should be expected to contribute to this ability of the radio to play transmissions. We can also use inverse thinking where we can say, what do the objectives appear to be? We can, for example, say, if we look at the radio, look, there's only a very small range of frequencies that affect the output. So it looks like the design of this thing has been done in such a way that as if the objective was that most frequencies have no influence on the output. So those are two very different ways of thinking. The normative way of thinking is what's its purpose. The inverse way of thinking is, can we see something that is optimized in a way? And um, in terms, in which case we don't know ex ante what that optimization process would be. And then we can say, of course, in terms of the details of the composition, what exactly is each component of the radio? So 
today I want to talk a little bit about inverse thinking because normative thinking is something that we often do as neuroscientists and cognitive scientists. You know, like when we study the way people perceive depth or something, it immediately comes with this connotation of what is depth useful for in the way we interact with the environment around us. But what about inverse thinking? So let's, let, let me highlight an area from which a lot of the relevant insights is, uh, are coming from, which is inverse reinforcement learning. Inverse reinforcement learning is a branch of machine learning. Reinforcement learning says we obtain rewards that depend on the state where we are in the environment. Uh, all our, it's a sequence of actions usually that gives rise to rewards that we get. For example, when we play chess, it's a sequence of steps that ultimately makes us win or lose the, the game. And uh, reinforcement learning is given the objective, namely win the game, say in chess, uh, what are the best steps that we could take? Inverse reinforcement learning is I see you play something. I might not know the rules of the game or the goals of the game, but I want to ask, what is it that you're trying to optimize here? And so in the inverse reinforcement learning, the, the setting is the following. I know an agent's behavior. And in many cases, I also know what they observe or what the environment is. I know, or I, I have reasons to assume that there is something that they optimize. It's an unknown reward function R that we don't know. And we want to figure out what the reward function R is. And in doing so, we will generally have to assume some simplicity about that reward function R. It's complementary to the normative approach where we say R is kind of falling out of the insights that I have about an ecological niche or about the prom. Now, like in the case of chess, I can say reasonably, it's pretty likely that you want to win because because that's like an agreed upon thing. And therefore you can say in chess, what we want to optimize is probability of winning. But when it comes to dance, say, what is it that you're optimizing? Like it's not, it's not that dance is something where I could say, well, here's the definition of the game of dance. <laughs> here's what you should be optimizing for. That might work when you play like the PlayStation game, Dance Dance Revolution or whatever that is called. Um, you get like a point for every time you do the right step. But when it's an interpretive dance of something, it's much more complicated. So. Um, let's first think about how that's even possible. Now you could say the set of possible reward functions is an infinite dimensional set. Anything you could do can be viewed as some kind of an optimization. But, but here's why it's actually in a way possible. And in inverse reinforcement learning, in most settings, it is possible. So I observe some behavior. For example, the agent goes from A to B. The dancer moves from one body configuration to another body configuration. Now, that behavior, that trajectory from A to B must be better than all alternatives that there could have been, namely better in the sense that it elicits more rewards. And now that produces a constraint on, re uh, on the reward, namely the chosen trajectory must have larger R than any other trajectory that we could have. And if we then observe lots of behaviors, we get lots of constraints. That set of constraints gets the possible functions that we optimize to be in a smaller set. And therefore, we can hope that it becomes identifiable, in particular, if we have further constraints on the set of functions R. The first thing is it's clear that it's not sufficient in that setting. Now, like you could say, well, I have an agent. It chose actions AI at each point of time. Now, if the reward function was the best behavior is the set of behaviors that we actually had, that is now a reward function that of course depends on I, depends on the time when that action was. Then of course, where AI star the actual actions, then this reward function always makes the behavior that you actually had be the optimal behavior and it doesn't describe absolutely anything. So, uh, in that case, this, this shows that in general, the problem is under constraint. But we might know things about R. For example, R may be temporally invariant. So 
so the rewards uh, that go with a certain body movement, say, might not matter if I do it now or if I do it 10, 10 milliseconds later, in which case that dramatically lowers the set of potential reward functions and makes this trivial uh, a solution to the uh, to the problem go away. And now in machine learning, it's used for lots of different ideas. For example, we can say, I want to build self-driving cars. And for that, it's important for me to kind of understand what it means to drive well. Well, I can look at lots of humans actually driving and say, oh, these guys want to keep some distance from one another. And they want to make sure that at a crossing, there's only one car moving at a time and things like that. Um, and they use it to, and then they use it to build self-driving algorithms for self-driving cars. Or you can say, what is it that helicopter pilots appear to be optimizing and then they use it and this was one of the earliest application of Andrew Ng showing that basically you can have helicopters fly upside down and do circles and very cool stuff by trying to just imitate the functions that human appear to be optimizing um, and then uh, what do human map makers optimize now if you want to do things like google maps like people have certain preferences about the way maps look like uh, for example, you could say, do I want to be more complete? In which case, if there is a traffic island, I would like draw two roads, one left and one right, or do I want to abstract? Now, this is a continuum on how, how much you want to abstract versus how you want to uh, be precise. It's great to be able to learn these things from humans. And then it's also like there's an important domain in cognitive science doing that, where uh, say this paper action understanding as inverse planning by Baker, Tenbaum and Sachs. Now, I want to show you an example from work that I've done in the past that is much simpler, but they, that, that highlights this ability to like basically get at reward functions. And it's very simple and it was a long time ago and I apologize for people who don't like research from a long time ago, but the reason why I wanted to highlight it here is it's just a very simple case of where we can identify something that people appear to be optimizing. So let's talk briefly about reverse engineering behavior. So let's say there's a target and you move your hand towards the target. Yeah, great. And if I tell you move to the target implicitly, you will have some notion of what it means for you to be good on the target. There's a reward. Even if I don't give you money, there's an implicitly, if I tell you, hey, move to that target, there has to be an implicit reward function of what it means for you to be good. Otherwise, you could just like move your hand, click, click. It's easy, it's fast. Okay, the distance somehow must relate to the loss. So you can say it's almost like there's an internal dartboard in your head that tells you how good is it to be at each position on that dartboard. Now, how could that look like? It could be that you only care about hitting the target. In that case, the loss function is, or the reward function is basically a delta function. You want to be right on target, the delta of x minus zero. If you're right on target, perfect, one point for you, everything else is zero. Alternatively, it could be that you care about the absolute error. So, the loss is minus the absolute distance to where you are. Or it could be that you care about the mean squared error that you have, which is something that we often assume in, uh, in, in movement science. Or it could be an inverted Gaussian or pretty much any other function. No? The, I want to mention here that this is the standard in motor control, the squared error. For people who do motor control, it turns out that the result is just that everything ends up being linear because the derivative of the, the quadratic function is, is a linear function and then it's mathematically very convenient. But that doesn't mean that the brain needs to work like that. There's preciously little reason for, your, for our brains to do us the favor of using cost functions that make the math particularly easy for us. So here's the design that we used for that. So we gave people a task, we called it a pea shooter task. So there's a distribution of where points appear relative to their, uh, their hand. And here you see like an animation of how that looks like. And so you see these points appear on the case, in the case. In the experiment, we make the points disappear after a short period of time. But here I keep showing them to you so that you know what's happening. So people see these points appear and they're 
they are instructed, like move your hand so that these points are as close as possible to align on the screen. So what they do, they then move their hand. And as they move the location where the points appear changes. And then we keep doing that until they're basically happy with what's there. Now, what we do is we give them a particular asymmetric curve that is, uh, that is constructed out of two Gaussians. One is a little left to the hand, the other one is a little right to the hand. The one to the left of the hand is narrow, the one on the right hand uh, to the right of the hand is wide, and it's calibrated so that the mean is zero and that the standard deviation is also constrained here. Okay, and then what we do is we change the asymmetry of that distribution. Now we can use two narrow Gaussians left and right, or we can two, take one very narrow one and one very Gaussian producing a very asymmetric curve. And then we can change that parameter. Okay. And now uh, we can observe the decisions that they make as a function of this asymmetry. And now what should we expect? If people have the mean squared error as function that they optimize, then the mean of the distribution should always, I mean, there should be noise. Of course, people are always noisy in cognitive experiments, but, the, uh, but, but basically in that case, the asymmetry should play no role. On average, they should always align the point clouds that they have with the mean of that point cloud. So the mean of the distribution should be zero. Now, if instead they maximize the number of hits, Let's get an intuition of what's happening. We have a narrow Gaussian to the left, we have a white Gaussian to the right. If we just care about the number of hits, we should mostly care for that narrow Gaussian. Uh, in fact, as uh, that ratio r goes to zero, we should, uh, we, should have, we should only care about that narrow Gaussian and that then produces a distribution like this. And then if we instead had mean absolute error, we would have something in between. The good thing is this is something that we can measure. Now, like I take all trials where say R was 0.5 and I see what the bias was that people had. And I take all trials where it was 0.2 and I see what the bias was. And uh, this is what you can see here. These are like the experimental data. Keep in mind, there's of course error bars, large error bars, because we can only do these experiments for an hour. Otherwise our subjects will really hate us. But what you can see is it's not that people use mean squared error. It looks a little like it's mean absolute error. Now, mean absolute error has some advantages, as we'll see in a second. Now, if we do this for the whole population, and this was one subject that we did here, if we do it for a whole population, we can take this idea of simplicity of R and simply say, give me a function that both explains everyone's data and also that is smooth. So those are the only two things that we put in. And then we can see what the actual loss function is and the error bus for that. And you see it looks like it's, it's almost quadratic close to zero and it's almost linear as we go away from it. So it looks like it's relatively outlier and sensitive, which means that an error that is very large doesn't count like an error that's twice as big, doesn't count four times as much. It counts more, maybe twice as much, but it doesn't count, it, it doesn't keep growing very strongly here. So that's the loss function that we, inferred there. What went in? It went an assumption here that the loss function is smooth that people use and it came in the data. So this is a typical way of like inverse approaches here. And I should mention that this way of having outlay and sensitive uh, estimation is very popular in machine learning. It's called robust estimation. Now I can do this experiment with all of you. You have lots of points here on the screen. I ask you to just tell me where, ask yourself on screen, or like you can make this whole screen, ask yourself on screen, where is the perceived middle of all those points? So let's move that red line there. And just at the bottom, you see those numbers. Just try and memorize at which number you feel, felt this to be, uh, to be uh, the, the middle of the points. And for me, I won't, I won't be biasing you by telling you what it's for me, but for me, it was around 16. I hope you all have your numbers because on the next screen, I will now show you how 
outlier and sensitive you are. What you see on the right hand side are the numbers that you've seen there. If you're at 16, it means that you care about the mean absolute error. If you were at 19, it would be the Gaussian, uh, it would be the quadratic, and, and there's different things in between here. So, but this is a way of basically getting at individual people's error functions. And I want to say that the same idea has been used by lots of different people in different aspects of cognitive science. And because its logic is different, I wanted to highlight it here. Uh, but like just uh, from our own work, we try to measure the cost functions about forces for movement is uh, what you see on the right hand side, where you can say that the cost of a movement depends on how long and how strong the force that you have to produce. We used it in the context of uh, reinforcement learning, where we actually had people reinforcement learn different uh, cost functions and so and so on and so forth. So this is like one approach and in general like inverse reinforcement learning is one of the approaches in cognitive science which assumes the following. I assume that people optimize something. I assume that that thing that they optimize is interesting and I'm trying to figure out what it is that they're optimizing. And I want to norm contrast this with normative. And if we do normative thinking, we might say false preferences should minimize energy consumption as energy matters in the human ecological niche. Or people should be outlier insensitive because sometimes like weird things happen that we can't do anything about. And um, and these normative approaches versus the inverse approaches are very follow a very different logical line, but they are meaningful no? because like the inverse approach can be used to then compare how close is the normative idea that I might have about the ecological niche to the things that people actually optimize assuming that over lifetime of learning or evolution they were ultimately learning to do the right thing. Now we can say can we do the same thing about brains? I don't have much time to uh, to talk about this but I'll try to do my best arguing that we should these ideas that are that exist in cognitive science that we really should bring that to the ways of studying brains. And the way my way my thinking there is colored is by two previous papers that I briefly want to tell you about. The first one is the microprocessor paper, where we said if we study the microprocessor, the way a neuroscientist studies brains, how well, how good would we be at producing a satisfying understanding of how the microprocessor works? And we found out that we weren't. And uh, that got me to rethink very much how we should think about brain. The second paper is a paper by Lily Krepp, where, where Lily Krepp and me, we've been, re we've been working a lot on neural network approach. Uh, based approaches. So the question is, how could you understand a neural network? And it's surprisingly unclear what we should be doing there. And, um, and there's two levels of granularity. I briefly mentioned it when we talked about reverse engineering behaviors, but you can say we might want to understand mechanism or we might want to understand like the process that gives rise to that. Keep in mind for the aspects that I talked about when reverse engineering behavior, they were all about the learning process. They were all about an optimization process. I wasn't making statements a bit like what individual neurons do there. Because as a cognitive scientist, in a way, I can't get at that level. There's too many levels of abstractions in between. Now, what we often try in cognitive science is we try and construct a mid-level where we can say, well, the mechanisms that we look about is activity in some brain area or the subjective probability that people assign to something. But that is that a level where we aim at mechanism or alternatively we can aim at learning, which is like just the processes that happen in a system to get us to be good at the functions that we're trying to optimize. Now, I might argue that Getting at mechanism in many cases is very hard and in some cases, depending on how it's defined, might be impossible. So bear with me. It's a complex argument, but one that I think is very important. Let's talk about simplicity in explanation. Here's the game of tic-tac-toe. If 
if you obsessed as a kid the way I did about tic-tac-toe, you will eventually have come up with this solution to tic-tac-toe. Now, there's like 250,000 possible games of tic-tac-toe, but the solutions to never lose at it are like super compressible. If, if I give you the following four rules, you will never lose at tic-tac-toe. The first one is win if you can. <laughs> if you can get three in a row, great, you win. The second one is don't lose. If the other one, if I don't prevent them now, can win, then I should do that. Now, if, if I can't do one or two, then do take the middle. And if the middle is already taken, take a corner. If you use those four rules, you will never lose a tic-tac-toe. So the solution of tic-tac-toe is super compressible. It's something that I can explain to you. It's if you want something that I can reverse engineer the right solution, something that I can communicate to a human. But here's the game of Go. People tried compressed Go into books for a very long period of time. And in fact, you can find thousands of books on the game of Go if you go to Amazon. But I'm pretty sure that you could read all, read all of them and you'd still be a very, very mediocre player. For example, the books, have, but, but it's all real. No? Like there's, for example, the concept of thickness. There's a book written on the concept of thickness. And indeed, if we did the same thing and tried that compression, maybe the first most important rule would be when if you can, don't lose if you can provide it and so forth. Rule number 100 might be, th uh, might be thickness. Rule 1 million might still be something that all grandmasters agree on. That is just something like very, very bizarre and something that most of us could never possibly understand. The important thing is they're all real. There could be a nature paper written about every one of those million rules and they are perfectly repeatable if you play enough games. So the question is, can we do similar things to neural networks? And like a neural network is like a game. It's just like arguably much more complex than Go. And in particular, the human uh, network, uh, the neural network that's in my brain um, will be even more complicated no, than like any neural network that we have at the moment. So what can we do with neural networks? Well, we can take a neural network and distill it into a simpler neural network, i.e. I try and approximate a neural network with another neural network, or we can do back of the envelope calculation. So distillation basically takes a neural network, uses it as a trainer for another neural network, and what we find is that yes, neural networks are compressible, but not all that much. So it's unclear if you could even take a very simple neural network that say is good at object recognition, say ImageNet, and that we could compress enough that a human could understand. And if they, if we can't understand it, we wouldn't want to uh, really want to call that reverse engineering the neural network after training. It's not reverse engineering the mechanism. Now, um, can we do these things? Yes, we can compress it, but it's generally very bad. We can then say, if we can't compress it, why is it so not incompressible? In the case of humans, we can make a back of the envelope calculation. 10 bits per second might be the amount of information you soak up, of arbitrary information, soak up from the environment. The year has pi times 10 to the seven seconds. Your lifetime is 30 years give or take a factor of 10, of course, always. But that means that like um, the number of bucks of arbitrary knowledge that sits in your brain might be 10 to the four bucks. This is not something that we'd call reverse engineering the brain. This is just like a, a dump of that. Now you can estimate how much information there might be in the DNA, and that seems to be much less. Now, what does that mean? It means that potentially the way the, the brain organizes itself could be relatively easy, even if the outside world is extremely complex. So here's the argument in a nutshell of the second part, and I'm sorry for rushing a little bit through it. The PyTorch code for making an artificial neural network is easy to understand. The resulting network with all of its millions of parameters is impossible for us to understand. Arguably, what we try and understand if we are in computation neuroscience and we want to understand neural computation is like understanding the weight matrix of a trained neural network, which might be entirely impossible. So instead, I argue that we should bring this inverse thinking to neuroscience. What is the objective function that the brain has? What is the optimizer that the brain has? So how do we get better at doing things? And what's the architecture that we have there? 
And I, let me skip through these. And um, now, zooming out again, for both cognitive science and neuroscience, we need to ask ourselves, what's the nature of understanding that we aim for? And everyone agrees in a way that we want to understand computation. How do neurons do it? But maybe that's impossible to understand at the level that we find satisfactory. But maybe we can say we should instead try and understand what the things are that, being, that are being optimized in human behavior or the things that are being optimized by the brain or potentially the triplet of anatomy the cost function being optimized and the optimizer itself. And um, in that sense, we cannot understand the parameters, but we can understand what they mean, which is knowledge about the world. And uh, let, me, let me just skip, skip over this here. So what's the take home message? Uh, so ultimately, I think much of neuroscience and cognitive science are a quest to reverse engineer. And I think we need to ask ourselves, what is the language in which we want to reverse engineer it. Do we want to know which molecules or atoms the radio is made out of? Or do we need to understand the purpose of the radio? Or maybe the things that the designers of the radio apparently optimized for. And I think inverse thinking is particularly important there. And I want to say that, of course, like all these ideas draw from a very rich intellectual tradition. Uh, Daniel Warpert, who was my postdoc supervisor a long time ago, I should have mentioned here as well, Josh Tenbaum, who shaped much of my thinking in that area, and the newer uh, work by Eric Jonas and Tim Lillycrap that got me more thinking about that. And with that, uh, my, my 30 to 40 minutes are certainly over. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to talk to all of you. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Cording, for um, your talk. And we will give like a five to 10 minute break before the Q&A session starts. And then we will proceed with that. Great. Welcome back everyone. I've seen a question in the chat um, from Ali Deniz uh, Gochan. Uh, can cognitive neuroscience explain human social interactions? <laughs> that's, 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 that's a great question. No? So, so let's, let's first say, yes, they do. There's a whole branch of cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience that are aimed at, uh, at doing such things. Uh, the... So, so let's, let's break that down a little bit. So there are multiple ways how you can think about it. The first one that is very common is that you take humans that communicate with one another. You put them into MRI scanners and you ask where in their brain there's activity. That is, if you want, like not really yet reverse engineering, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a first step. Now, like, let's just see what happens. And indeed, there's, of course, brain areas that are more involved in that than other things. The second one is you can ask questions about human language itself. So you can often ask normative questions where you could say human language is... Uh, here, here would be, for example, a question that people ask. New, human language is in a way repeating itself. Now you could take, you could rewrite English language and make all words shorter by taking, by, by taking away information that is basically duplicated. So it turns out that there's, it's like there's a sweet spot. If I, if, if I don't duplicate information, then there's a lot of information that people will miss because I basically have, have more information than I can get across to the other side. So there's arguments being made about human language itself being optimal for by having just the right amount of redundancy so that we can bring it across. There are, uh, there's, there's a lot of normative work asking if we can view the grammar of human languages as being optimized for something. 
Um, there is certainly a lot of work that asks how human communication is affected by, say, having lesions in some areas. So, yes, like uh, this is one of uh, the great questions, if you want, like how communication between humans work is one of the great questions in cognitive, uh, cognitive science generally, but also cognitive neuroscience. Thank you very much, Dr. Recording. By the way, I, I would like to emphasize on uh, if you if anyone wants to contribute or wants to ask follow-up questions, do not hesitate to do so. Um, I actually have one sort of abstract and theoretical question, which I love to ask to my cognitive psychology professors as well. Um, I would like to ask that question to you as well. Um, so is it possible to create artificial consciousness and how far we are away from that oh my <laughs> this is a very hot question so um the first question is what we mean with that and different people mean very very different things so uh, there are the panpsychists of which christoph koch is probably uh, one of the more visible ones. There's, there's a lot of more historical proponents for that. So they basically say that anything is conscious as long as a lot of bits of information are, com are combined with other bits of information. I want to remind everyone that in that view, a hot stone is profoundly conscious. So if you make a stone hot, you have all the phonons, the vibration modes in there interacting with one another. Uh, so the more you, the more hot you make a stone, the more conscious it gets. So in that sense, artificial consciousness is not only achievable, but 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 everything is artificial consciousness. And like heating up a stone is definitely artificial consciousness. But um, but it, but. But I don't think that, and, and there's this measure phi that is very popular that people use to measure that kind of thing. Um, the things that view has going for it is that if you're dead, you're not conscious, like, like phi gets to be zero. And if you're epileptic, phi also gets to be zero. And in between, it's greater than zero. So it must measure consciousness in that view. But I don't think that that's what we mean. Now, like there is this like subjective feeling that for us defines consciousness. But, but the word consciousness, as we uh, deal with it, like means lots of things to us. No, it's we are conscious of those things that we commit to memory and can later on report that we had that. Now, we can build artificial systems that, in a way, have a record of their own thoughts. The easiest is say, chess programs that use Monte Carlo tree search. They of course know which trees they've already visited so that they don't need to revisit that. But, but in, so in a way it has a component of consciousness which is a record of past thoughts and maybe knowledge of which past thoughts were successful and which ones are not. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure like a bit, but clearly it's still missing a lot of things. It doesn't have like this qualia being there feeling to it. Now, as we keep building AI systems, they of course become more sophisticated and have more layers. And in that sense, they will probably in a way become more similar to the way we think. But what exactly we mean with consciousness is opaque to me. And I kind of, I tend to be sad for everyone who overly goes into the uh, into the use of the word consciousness because it's to me not narrow enough. Now, like I'd like to take that word consciousness, take it into its ten subcomponents and talk about those subcomponents and not use those compound words because because I don't really know what's meant by by that. But of course, this like if, if you want a counterpoint, let's say ask Anil Saf, who has a very different view about it. Thank you very much. Um, so we have another question from um, Arash or Arash. Um, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So if we have models, objective functions, and optimizers in the brain, how can we study 
how the brain does optimization. For example, what type of experiment? Yeah, and, and it's great that Arash is also on screen. <laughs> and uh, Arash is uh, super, uh, was super active at all of Neuromatch and I want to just publicly tell him my thanks here. Um, so, so how could we study optimizers in the brain? Well, based on the background that we have in neuroscience, in a way we have some ideas. You know, like we know that say, dopamine activity is related to rewards and expected rewards. And in that sense, there's a branch of uh, neuroscience that asks to which level neuromodulators could be used as if you want the engine of optimization in the brain. But there's different theories where, for example, the idea that if we have cortex and we see this as like multiple layers, how like for each brain area, higher levels could act like the supervisory signal to the lower neurons. There's also uh, the, uh, no, no, there's, there's a whole space of how the brain, uh, of theories of how the brain could be doing optimization. And I think we haven't seen enough uh, experiments that really dig into that. In that sense, I want to though uh, plug a paper of Matthew Lacombe that just came out, where he asks what, what uh, role layer one of cortex might play uh, and this is like great uh, physiological work, which, lay, uh, which uh, causal role uh, layer one in cortex plays for learning. And it seems that it's absolutely crucial. But, but yes, like if we, if we say that what we should understand isn't what individual neurons do. And like the history of neuroscience, much of it since the 50s has been, let's go in with electrodes and ask what this neuron cares for. And if we instead refocus a little more on like asking questions about learning, we might, we might ask, okay, which neurons play which role in the learning process? And that is very doable these days. You know, like we can perturb neurons with optogenetics and electrically and chemically. And we have now these cool optical sensors with which we can know which neuromodulator is at which place at which point of time. So there, there, there are a lot of ways how we can start going into this with technology that exists at the moment and asking what happens during learning and then interpreting those what happens during learning in terms of optimizers and functions being optimized. Uh, thank you, Con Conrad. Great. Uh, so I have a specific question too. Uh, like uh, I'm wondering uh, whether uh, having um, more uh, layers of neuron will help understanding learning or just having a couple of them uh, interact with each other and really reverse engineer to the last spike of each neuron would be enough to figure out the optimizers. Like, uh, is there a local rule that would uh, really um, generalize to the entire brain or there will be like different abstract uh, optimizers, abstractions of optimizers that work differently at different uh, levels of network? Um. It, it, yeah, so, so let me unpack your question a little bit, because there's like a mystery that people need to appreciate to like be wowed the way they should be by the brain. The brain, if you want, uh, say, say photons come into my eyes, my photoreceptors fire, uh, fire. It goes into my LGN, it goes into my primary visual cortex, it goes through lots of brain layers and countless neurons are involved in that. And then I learn, maybe I learn how to recognize your face on YouTube or something. Um, and, and then all those neurons change. Now, like, it's not that we have like somewhere an output layer in Conrad's brain that does the learning and the rest is just sitting there. No, like everything learns and I'll be better. Which, 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 which is mind boggling if you think about it. We have a neuron that might be 10 synapses removed from you saying, oh yeah, hi Conrad, I recognize you. And that neuron changes in such a way that you get better at doing that. And now this is where the, the, the issue of locality comes in. If that one neuron could like see something non-global. If that one neuron could like know, oh, what I did contributed this and this way to Arash's decision to say, oh, that's Conrad, hi Conrad. Um, and if I had been more active, it would have been faster. Then 
if, if you didn't have this locality, then learning would be very easy. If every neuron could be omni, uh, it could, could know everything, then the problem would be easy. But the problem is each of these neurons in your brain that are, just sees those like 10,000 neurons that are presynaptic to it and projects to some other neurons. And it might see some neuromodulators and yet somehow, so, so very clearly the neuron can only do something local. There is not like this magical uh, wand that tells it what would be good and what wouldn't be. And yet it somehow locally gets that information from everywhere else. And now to answer your specific question. So the neuron does something local. So how can it be doing this thing that's good for the overall brain by just doing something local? There are a lot of theories in that space. Uh, there are, I can write down for you local rules that will probably optimize the global thing. And people have done that. And there's an intellectual tradition, I think it largely started with Hinton, but with a lot of other people contributing in lots of different ways. And, um, uh, and so we have these theories and uh, I, during my PhD, I, I, I worked on some way where it was local rules where you had bars that tell you about the gradients and individual spikes that tell you about what the neuron does. But if you look at, uh, if you start from neural networks, there's two things happening. There's this forward processing and then there's the backward handling of errors. How should I be doing, how sh what should I change so that I'm better in that algorithm we call the backpropagation of error algorithm. And um, in a way, so we have ideas. So we know that now that it's possible, we know that there exist local learning rules that would optimize the global thing, but we don't know that the brain does it in any of these. So I think we should, we should do a lot of a physiological question asking of how how does the brain make local changes so that you in the end get better at the big thing and i don't think we have done that to the level that we should so far and i think it's super exciting you know like how can like local changes make the big thing better cool thank you thank you conrad <laughs> thanks Thank you very much. And uh, we have a question from Gözde. Uh, would you like to ask it out loud or would you like me to read it? Yeah, you can read it. It's not a problem. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank um, you. All right. Um, can we study on both emotion and reinforcement learning? If yes, could you please let me know some key points. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's uh, let let's look at the components. Now, there's like a big literature on emotion processing in the brain, uh, where say people ask, "What's different in my brain when I when I'm happy about something, or when I'm sad, or when I'm fearful?" Um, there is. A, there's a good sized literature also asking about reinforcement learning in computational neuroscience, where say people like Nathaniel Daw, Yal, Niv, um, a lot of people involved in that area ask questions about um, how the brain might be doing reinforcement learning. And in fact, they often have humans solve very reinforcement learning like tasks while studying their brain. I should also mention uh, we have in movement science, you know, you know, like a lot of my history in the lab is like I study how people move their hands. And uh, uh, I, we, we did study how people do movement reinforcement learning now. But if I interpret your question right, you also want to ask how the two of them come together. Now you could say that the emotions that we have in a way define the training signals that we use to learn from, uh, from things. Things. And there is a considerable work also at that intersection where you can say, if I feel overwhelmed by something, it's much harder for me to learn properly. So in that sense, there is this interplay between the human reinforcement learning ways and the human emotion ways. I'm not really an insider much on that, uh, on that literature. 
but, uh, but there exists certainly some kind of an interaction between the people studying learning and the people studying in emotion where people then really ask how emotions affect your learning and vice versa. Now there's also learning for emotion topics like learned helplessness where say if whenever I try something it fails miserably it gets much harder for me to or like it, it affects my emotional system where I start being negative about things before I even try them. Um, but it's it's a beautiful space between those two and the idea that emotion and learning can really be taken apart is like a truly misguided idea. The things that make us so successful in this environment, I think, is that we productively most of the time use our emotions. Now we get impatient and it's really important that we get impatient. We have this curiosity and understanding curiosity is just, you know, like curiosity is this emotional feeling and yet it makes us explore the things that make us good at learning in the future. So it's all connected in a way. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Selim Shekhar. Uh, would you like to ask your question out loud? Um, okay. He it says it's a little bit noisy there, so I'll take that. Uh, I come across a recent machine learning paper from Tenenbaum's um, group that explores the effects of good old fashioned symbolic components over current neural networks. What is your opinions about this kind of neurosymbolic hybrid models? Okay, this is a fantastic question and one that very much touches on how my lab and myself think at the moment. So traditionally within AI, if you want, there's two different flavors of doing study. I'm just giving the background so that everyone can appreciate the question. Um, there's people building neural networks that, um, that have shown us a lot of amazing things over the last couple of years. There's also people doing what we call good old fashioned AI where people are building truly symbolic systems where you could say, um, X is my brother, uh, uh, therefore I might say things about maybe uh, maybe the gender of X, you know, like, like uh, being implied by, uh, by the statement, X is my brother. So, or like uh, uh, X is my sister, uh, no, X is my mother, Y is my mother's mother, uh, therefore, uh, why is uh, why must be of the class grandmother? So in statements like these, if we are thinking symbolically, are very very simple. They 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 just naturally come out of the relations as as we as we defined it there. For neural network making such logics tends to be very very difficult. So you can say if you if you look at like modern machine learning systems, say GPT-3, it's amazing. The text that it produces sounds like English text. It's just like it's lacking in logical deductions. Not like it 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 uh, there, there was this great example where they say on planet X, there's like a group of unicorns uh, uh, roaming in the forest and and they talk. That was, that was the introduction that they gave. And then like one sentence later, GPT-3 talked about the two horns of the unicorns, which doesn't make any sense because it cannot express the fact that the unicorn has exactly one horn. It's not a unicorn if it has two horns. And, uh, and, and, and so if we look at currently successful machine learning systems. They often have um, a neural network to do things that a neural network like. Let's say if you take alpha zero, the system that's very good at chess and go if you train it on it, it, it's very good at telling you that position looks pretty good. But it also does planning where it looks into the future. That whole part of planning is not a neural network. It's outside of it. 
So what often happens, it's, it's fully symbolic. You know, like it's, it's, there is a representation of the go board that would be where we would be if we would take that step. It's not fuzzy. It's not like a neural network in between. So it is uh, the combination of a symbolic system coded up by human programmers, namely Monte Carlo Tree Search, and a position evaluator that's learned by a neural network. So all the or the bulk of successful AI systems seem to be using a symbolic Josh Tenbaum type coded by a human PhD student from together with a neural network that solves the other parts of that. So I think, um, so, so these two approaches clearly uh, have distinct and meaningful parts or let's say take causality you know like the light switch turns on the light it's very difficult for a neural network to represent those things now if we look in our head we clearly have both you know there's this like neural network type i look at you and i'm you look like you know so you look like nestle um and but there's also this if i would turn off my computer right now, they would be angry at me because they would be just ridiculously rude. There is kind of like, which is a very symbolic statement. It kind of doesn't make much sense. But at the same time, the fact that I just had that thought is very much not a symbolic statement. It's like, how can I produce a thought that is appropriate for that situation? So it's clear in our cognition that we have both. And it is a huge mistake of the connectionist field that they feel that if you just give a neural network enough compute, it will happen by itself. But it's also a huge mistake of cognitive scientists often thinking that kind of we don't need like this intuitive neural network type like way of like thinking and i think the key for both understanding brains and human behavior better and for building better ai system is that we need to build ways of combining those two in a meaningful way and it's kind of if we want to talk about causality it almost doesn't make sense to be purely in a neural network way you know like or, or if we think about objects, you know, like this is a coffee cup. It, it like, and by virtue of it being a coffee, a coffee cup, it inherits, I know things about it because it's of type coffee cup. And coffee cups in general inherit stuff from being cups, which inherit stuff from being material objects, which inherit stuff from being in this environment. And this like, um, this like set of ontological thinking and causal thinking and so forth is very natural if you're in a space of symbols and very unnatural if you're in a space of pure connectionist thinking. And um, I think we will more and more see an appreciation that basically both that, uh, you know, and like the Tenbaum type thinking has, uh, uh, is rooted in an intellectual tradition that is very, very old and where, say, Stuart Russell has very nicely, it, it's still a wonderful book uh, about like, uh, like AI and modern approaches to that. And, and yes, we need both. And, and we should probably stop doing this fight of like, yeah, you can't have it, you can't have it. No, like all good systems hybridize the two of them. Thank you very much. Um, so we have one question from YouTube. Um, so from Hamid Bashko, how to incorporate uh, evolutionary models with the approach you describe, um, for example, architecture, learning rule, and object of function, and use them in cognitive science or systems neuroscience. And he added by, uh, they might be useful at forming inductive biases for certain tasks in terms of exploring architectures, learning rules, or even objectives. Do you know a study doing this? And he, thank you for the great talk. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, okay, um, that's a complicated question. So, 
um, what's the evolutionary information that we can use? There's two strands here. You know, like there's one strand which is just evolution justifies normative thinking for us, which is if a behavior is important in our environment, maybe low energy walking is important in the environment where humans are, then we can use evolutionary thinking to just justify that if we look at the brain, we should be looking for algorithms that lower the energy consumption of walking. In that form, it's used extensively all over the normative literature. But there's another one, which is the comparative anatomy and the comparative behavior literature, where we can say, we look at people uh, that say, compare different animals, and uh, of which they know that all these animals have uh, have short evolutionary, it, it wasn't long ago that their evolutionary paths diverged. And yet we can look at the divergence of behavior. And that is like rather common in certain corners of the evolution field. And then we can say, oh, look, they are like very, very, very related those animals. And yet here are very strong behavioral differences. And then we can say, well, but look, we can just get to all of them by just assuming that along a small number of dimensions, there were differences. Maybe this animal, uh, maybe this evolutionary, they, they, these animals have very different degrees of fear in an environment. Or like say, we, have, we look at birds, they have different length of birds. And we can then use those ideas to say something about the representation. And then of course we can do comparative anatomy work and say like, oh, look here, like there's just this new area that appeared in one species that doesn't appear, didn't appear in that other species. Learning something about like the way architectures are set up or learning rules are set up. You know, like you can do the same thing by comparative learning studies. What, how is like one monkey different at learning from another monkey? Um, I, I can, unfortunately, I'm not aware of like a good piece of work that, that would give you like the overall picture. There's like lots of local good pieces. Um, I imagine there might be a book, but I, I'm not aware of that. And if, it, if there's not the right book doing that, I hope that someone writes it soon. Thank you very much. Um... We have one more question in the chat from Aydenis Chodgechen. <laughs> um, what is more efficient and better way to learn information for human brain? Hmm. Okay, so so I interpret the question as which factors kind of influence the speed with which we learn, or like like a better way is a better often means just learn faster. There are cases where better means learn the right things, and I have something to say about that as well. So, uh, but what are the uh, what are the factors for people to learn more efficiently? Well, um, if it seems that it's important, they learn faster, and we know that there's like neuromodulators involved in that. That basically, if it's emotionally very salient, you just have much better access to memory than if things are not salient. And salience can be established by positive or negative reward or perceived threat and things like that. But there's also more efficient ways. I, 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 just, I just can't like not plug causality in that, in that way. So um, people are profoundly interested in causal relationship, uh, in causal relationships between things. It's not just that we want to be good at things. We want to know like, well, if this happens, then because this happens, this happens. So, so if, and if you want to learn causal relationships, it's incredibly helpful to be able to put top things. So that's why we're so interested. You know, like you go into new rooms, there's a couple of buttons. Of course, you're going to press all the buttons because you learned that, that buttons often have causal effects and you, you're profoundly interested in like the causal structure in this world. So one way of making people better at learning is giving them ability to perturb the world. Because it turns out that causal inference without perturbation is usually impossible. 
And that's why people are so interested. Now, like if you just put kids into a new environment, they're like totally like, okay, let me try this. Let me try this. Can I stand on this? Can I like throw that cup down and see how it splatters? Like there's all those things. And, and in that sense, like one way of making people more efficient at learning is just give them the chance to causally perturb the environment. Thank you very much. And is there anyone else who would like to ask questions or any contributions? Um, I believe, no. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who contributed and asked questions and of course, Dr. Cording, thank you so much for um, participating in the very first cognitive webinar. We are honored to have you here and very pleased to um, hear your talk for today. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, thanks so much for having me. It was a great honor. Okay.